Hello, my name is Sean Plott. And I'm Tristan Brand. And welcome to Why We Like It, the show where we talk about any story from any medium and why we think it's awesome. This introduction is our fourth or fifth attempt at it because I have botched it so many times, but because this is the one, let me tell you that in this episode we're going to be looking at the book Ready Player One in our usual Why We Like It fashion. We're going to spoil the whole thing, so if you haven't read it, well you should. You should pause it right now and go read it. But before you do, I'll tell you what it's about. Ready Player One is essentially a treasure hunt. It's a story of a boy who lives in a bleak future world where reality is falling apart and people live in giant junkyards, but they can plug into a virtual reality internet that's so much more amazing than reality that everyone spends all their time there. And if you solve a mysterious three-part puzzle, then you win the billionaire's fortune who owns the entire virtual internet. And we think the book is great. We do. I agree with that statement, Mr. Plot. Yes, and of course we have some <laughs> extra special things going on this week. I don't know why I keep saying week, because we do this show fairly irregularly. Hopefully it'll happen more often, but most notably, I'm doing this without this contact in. So um, It makes it very special, I yes. agree. Now whenever you say things, I can be like, I don't see what you mean. <laughs> it's all worth it for the And pun. I'm going to laugh every time. So, uh, Tristan, I'm going to, of course, kick it over to you. To talk about our favorite theme with any book ever, which is Resonance. We've probably talked about this in at least all of our episodes. three and a half of the other episodes <laughs> have been about that. But, you know, whereas you have something like Game of Thrones that does a lot with, like, what the character archetype is, um, what their storyline is, that you feel like, oh, I can relate to that. This is just the most overt Resonance I've ever seen in any book. <laughs> yep. Uh, this book is basically the result of uh, a huge baller nerd going down i'm gonna write a book about awesome shit and it's all from the 80s because <laughs> the 80s was the awesomest year yeah a lot of it's from the 80s um but to be fair there's awesome you know this is sort of like the 80s stuff is embedded in uh kind of the future fantasy of how the internet could be even more awesome than it currently is and that that's hard to imagine because the internet's already this uh sort of infinite paradise i mean you go to reddit and you're like i am in heaven right now <laughs> <laughs> this is not a compelling argument this far. Yes, heaven, well, slash r slash awe is heaven. There's some other subreddits that are distinctly unheavenly like. Um, guy of the jump. <laughs> dude. Um, but sorry, go on. I interrupted by laughing at you. <laughs> well, there'll be no more laughter in this episode. It's a lot. Anyway, so this book is just a bunch of awesome shit all thrown together. And it's focused around video games um, with a bunch of other things. Uh, so basically there's this really sweet uh, virtual reality internet-like construct, um, which is a little bit reminiscent of what um, Neil Stevenson did in uh, um, Snow Crash. Snow Crash. Uh, thank you for saving me. Boom! <laughs> um, which is basically uh, for people like me, and I'm going to just project and suggest that people like Sean and people like you, good viewer, might be included this this is like the greatest thing ever and what we hope will happen before we die um yeah because then we can just stop pretending about the, caring about the real world and uh spend all of our time in the internet um so it's just this big like you know sprawling you can be your own avatar you can play games you can hang out with people um you no longer have to see your friends in real life and look at their you know uh, pedestrian normal bodies because they'll all be wearing you know incredibly ha handsome uh, striking um, avatars um, sort of like surrogate the film surrogates actually uh, and which is just amazing and then within this awesome new internet there's this treasure hunt which is like this game within a game and this treasure hunt was designed by the creator of the awesome internet which is called the Oasis uh, or probably not the but just Oasis um, and he was like this super eccentric billionaire, totally obsessed with the 80s. Uh, and when he died, he left behind these like cryptic, this cryptic video that was basically like, hey, I hid this, you know, secret, uh, um, this hunt inside Oasis. Uh, and whoever completes it um, gets my fortune. So, of course, that, you know, gets pretty much everyone uh, chasing after this, uh, after this treasure. Um, but the thing is, is it's really, really hard. And in fact, no one makes any progress. And eventually this sort of becomes more of a niche thing. And you've got these really hardcore people called uh, called gunters, uh, I believe is the term they used in the book, um, who spend all their time 
obsessed on trying to find this hunt uh, or solve this hunt. Um, now the key is that this hunt ha you have to find three keys, each of which open three gates. No one has even found the first key. Uh, I don't actually know how many years after he's died this takes place. I want to say yeah. five. I could be wrong about that. But I mean, it's like it's like interesting. Like everything you've talked about, I feel like there's like so many layers of resonance. And I mean, you and I were actually talking about this. That like if you strip away all the references to stuff, mm -hmm. it's like the most straightforward plot in the world. Yep. It's like okay. The, the chapter one is just a statement of the goal. Yep. And that's it. I don't even think that they introduce... The chapter one's like this exposition on, like, Oasis, the treasure hunt, the billionaire. Yeah, like, they don't even introduce the main character, do they? Not really. Like he, or it, he, the, he, the author, not they, but, like, yeah. I don't even think he introduces... It, I mean, it's sort of implied that the main character's narrating it, but, yeah, he's not directly introduced, really, until I mean, chapter... One or... I mean, it, it's like, it's, yeah, it's, it's like, okay, intro. Here's what the book's about. Yep. Okay, next segment, the goal is the key, and there's an obstacle in the way, and then the obstacle's overcome, and then he gets the key. Yep. And then same thing with every subsequent key and gate, where it's just, like, doing this. And then there's, like, a slight deviation at the end, where it's like, okay, well, then he gets captured and put into, basically, indentured servitude in the real world. Mm-hmm. Only to go back in and solve it all again. I mean, like, it, it's it's such a simple plot, especially when you contrast it with something like Game of Thrones. Mm -hmm. There's, like, an ensemble cast of a billion characters. There's only ten left now uh, in the series, but, <laughs> but it started with a lot. And it, But it, it's interesting to me that whereas, you know, the, the complexity is what grabs you so much in uh, something like Game of Thrones, in, in this, like, the, the, I feel like the base layer is just all the references. Yep. Where it's like, yeah, I sat down to play some games. I was thinking maybe some Pac-Man or some Zaxxon or some Space Invaders or some uh, Galaga. And he, ju he just lists off like 15 of them. And I've heard of seven. So I'm like, oh yeah! Like seven times. Yep. And I mean, there were some of them that I like didn't get. Like I didn't I didn't know a lot of the movie references. I mean, I've seen Real Genius when I was like tiny but I, I just remember that it was a movie. But it was just interesting to me how powerful an impact that has just to state those sorts of things. I think just because so broadly you nerds grew up alienated based upon those. And this is just so unabashedly nerdy. It just lists a paragraph with one verb and then 15 commas interspersed with video game names. And I'm like, <laughs> yeah! Like, Tristan, yeah. You, was that your phone? It might have been my phone. Oh my, that is that so... That would imply that I forgot to turn <laughs> my phone off, which is obviously that is not so... a possible thing. That is so unprofessional of you not to have your phone off. Um... Because I, I am not turning it off right now, Sean. I can assure you. <laughs> what a disaster this. this show is. What? <laughs> Let's restart. Well, Give it to, to the one viewer who's still watching. We're very sorry. We are uh, so sorry. We if there's anything we can do to make it up, we think that we can do so by <laughs> continuing this talk about resonance. <laughs> yes. So, um, you, you know, there's something kind of cool about this. Like, you know, think about all the sort of rules of like good storytelling. It's like you know. Not too much exposition, you know, show, don't tell, you know, get straight to the story, don't worry, you know, give them enough setting to sort of get started, but don't yeah. worry about it. Uh, Ready Player One starts with an entire prologue, which is nothing but exposition. And I just reread it. And, you know, sort of yeah, trying to be objective about it, it's not like... In one sense, it's not even riveting exp exposition, where it's just like, the world is dying and crazy things are happening. It's sort of just like, yeah, well... There's this video game, and there's these, there's this internet thing, and there's this billionaire, and he likes the 80s, and there's lots of games, and it's sort of like, you know, it's very, it's very straightforward. I mean, it's well written in the sense that there's not like a lot of extra words, but it's just this very straightforward exp exposition, which is like exactly what you're not supposed to do, um, and yet it's absolutely fascinating, and it's fascinating because one, it's just a sweet idea, and two, because we are in the dead bullseye center of the audience for this book and when you're in the dead center of the audience for the book um, the author can get away with a lot he can break a lot of rules uh, he has already got you with his concept um, and he's going to attack you sort of from a very narrow uh, in a very narrow sense so in this book how do you how does he get you he gets you by talking about video games 80s nerdy stuff virtual reality internet 
And frankly, the more he talks about that, the more I want to read it. And, I don't need a character. I don't need action. I don't need conflict. I don't need tension. Maybe later. <laughs> uh, just like spend five pages telling me in to every pixel how this amazing, glorious thing exists, and I will be salivating and lapping it up the whole time. What, and what's interesting to me is that like I feel like dead center audience is a lot broader than you might initially think. Um, mm-hmm. Because it, in terms of just the description of Oasis versus the real world. I mean, this is already something that a lot of people relate to. Like, I mean, you and I both just, like, have our phones, like, right next to us. Like, we both had to mute them. Like, I, the, I have an internet browser open, like, right here. And I'm going to begin surfing the internet the second this show is done. Um, we have all the information ever. I see I have 11 updates on Twitter that I can check. We're just bombarded with all this information. And, like, the digital world to some extent, for many people nowadays, is more interesting than the real world. I was just in Korea, and on the subway, literally everyone is hunched over their phone. No one's making eye contact. I could stab someone to death, and no one would look up. And it's 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 crazy to me that um, how similar so many of the ideas are in this extreme sense in Oasis, how much I'm just like, that's it feels a lot like reality. You know, I, I think of what people do with Minecraft, where they build these elaborate castles. And then I, I go outside, and a garbage can's tipped over, and there's garbage <laughs> spilling out. And I'm like, well, I, I can't. It's not my garbage. I can't clean it up. I don't have the reason. I'm going to put it in my garbage can and bring that outside. That actually sounds kind of reasonable, but still, I don't do that, <laughs> right? Like, But it, it's, it's this commentary that you relate to really seamlessly. And it uses... Uh, Ready Player One uses so many little details, like conversations and chat rooms are listed just the way they would be in a Skype conversation or any messenger program conversation. It just reads like that with like the colon and like the types of thing and the LOL nice and keeps going because everyone experiences social interaction through that medium, so it's suddenly not weird to put in there. And then how does the real world exist? Well, people are in junkyards on the outskirts of the city, or if you're in the city and you're working, at the end of the book we find out that you're basically a slave. You're not even allowed to leave your workplace, and they have, like, a collar in your ear or something that, like, keeps track of you wherever you are to make sure that you're working. And you work for your freedom, not for any any reward or anything like that. And, I mean, a lot of people are talking about that nowadays. And with just that framework, um, the person who actually recommended me the book, she doesn't play games at all. She just has watched a couple of those 80s movies and thought they were good. But that whole structure of the way Oasis in the real world works caught her enough. I mean, she was even asking me about some of these games. Like, wow, were games really like that? And I'm like, they were so much worse. They were they were harder. <laughs> worse design. So yeah, that's yeah. I just yeah. think that it's like it's like much broader. I mean, if you, like, cause I almost feel like it's trendy now to consider yourself like, oh, I'm a nerd, you know, like, oh yeah, oh Pac-Man, I totally played Pac-Man. Ugh. You're very chick, Sean. Oh, do you? <laughs> chick. That's a terrible use of that word. No, I like it. I like it. Very, very yeah. chick. It's, it's like a horrible use. Spelled T C H I K. Yes. <laughs> very chick. Um, I, I think another thing to you know sort of not overlook. It, it's not like technically part of resonance, but just sort of another reason that it's like grabbing people like us so deeply. Uh, it's just you know, is that it's an it, it's it's like an ideal escapist fantasy, and I don't I really don't mean that in a bad way. I I, don't, I think yeah. some people think escapist fantasy as some sort of like curse word where it's just like oh yes that is low literature um that's crap i love reading fantasy i I love escaping into fantasy the pulpier Uh, the better baby yeah um and you know what when i was a kid and i was playing D &D and i was playing reading fantasy books and i was you know doing all that stuff uh i was escaping into it i was imagining myself as the hero going into these dungeons defeating you know fighting the goblins casting magic spells flying doing all this cool stuff i love that like that that insp- that uh, you know, honest desire to actually experience some of that stuff, uh, is is sort of what you know propelled me into enjoying it, um, and has continued to do so. So the idea of a technological solution 
and not even well, not only that, but like a reasonably plausible technological solution that allows me to go from imagining these things to actually being able to experience, you know, a Dungeons and Dragons dungeon on my own, or maybe a sequence from one of my fan favorite fantasy novels or movies. Again, like one of the cool things in this in this novel, he's reenacting films. He reenacts. Monty Python, Monty Python and the Holy Grail. That movie's amazing. Think how much fun that would be. Like, That's right. Yeah, I forgot how many reenactment sequences there were. And and I mean, it's just, uh, I mean, like you were saying earlier, the main character is just such an everyman character. He's just so mm-hmm. easy. He's just he's vacuous. He's he he's just a first person you is really. And it's just like, everything's so self indulgent in like every way. Mm-hmm. Like, I mean, I especially love what you were talking about, about being in the D&D dungeons. Because, I mean, I feel like, um, for any of you who have never played Dungeons & Dragons, you should. It's, it's, even people are like, oh, no, that's way too nerdy. Like, Dungeons & Dragons, I think, is probably one of the most accessible forms of gaming for, for anyone. Where it's just like, no, 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 get in, the, get in your character. Visualize a little bit. And you have this dungeon master who's taking things seriously, who's, like, guiding you through. Unless he sucks, in which case it's terrible. <laughs> There's a notorious bad dungeon master that my friends know who literally every monster fight is like four hours and just, of just wailing and wailing and he dies and he drops okay loot. Anyways, um, what am I talking about? Oh yeah, like Dungeons and Dragons was the foundation for many games. And I would say the start of, of whole genres where basically you're, you're a character... Like a wizard or a gnome or a giant depends on what your setup is or a cleric or bard or and um you define your identity and you go out on adventures with the rest of your team and then you had games like the early rpgs like final fantasy one was essentially a dungeons and dragons statistics systems with some loose graphics where you made your party and you went around on adventures and tried to save the world Mm-hmm. And as this went down, this is like the whole JRPG early day genre. It was just like straight, like, let's take Dungeons and Dragons systems and translate them over. Baldur's Gate, same thing. Like, like these games were trying to directly translate the experiences of playing in these D&D games. Oh, and Planescape mm-hmm. Torment, which amazingly I still haven't played. Amazingly. But anyways. You can't just admit that on, on, on air, Sean. Dude, okay, and I haven't I'm played... I'm a little worried about you now. I haven't played Half-Life 2 either. Like, I'm just wow. fucking up so bad. Credibility is just taking a real nosedive. Uh, <laughs> folks, I have played Half-Life, so if you'd like to unfollow Sean on Twitter and follow me... It's right there. Uh, you can see the names to punish right there. But anyways, I'm, I'm going on a little <laughs> bit of a tangent, but I mean, like... So many uh, uh, the early Zort games that that are like very like adventure and RPG both birthed from a lot of those early pencil and paper RPG experiences, and then to just make the first dungeon uh, in the book, the first task in actual Dungeons and Dragons crypt, mm-hmm. like literally the most famous one too. Yeah, the two horrors, I think it's called. Yeah, and, and I mean like that is. That, that has, like, long been the goal fantasy of many early games and still modern game designers. Like, how do you translate that open-world narrative of D&D and bring it into real life? And here it's just like, oh, yeah, you get to do that. Uh. And we're so close to imagining that now. We have stuff like Google Glass. We have the Oculus Rift. You know, these are, these are nascent technologies. But, like, you know, look how fast things have grown in the last 10 years imagine where we're going to go 10 years in the future with this stuff like i don't think you know i don't think the alpha version of oasis is actually that far off mm-hmm. uh, which is really really cool because you know sometimes when we're talking about you know a, a neat sci-fi or fantasy novel it's just like oh yeah it'd be so awesome to fly or to you know travel light speed or to visit other planets or to cast magic spells or become harry potter and <laughs> Uh, you yeah, know, yeah. Wizarding Academy, um, and 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 then you know it's like well none of that stuff's even you know remotely possible. This is frankly plausible. Um, yeah, in, like, in fact, if you if you were forcing me to bet money, like in the next century, I would be astonished if we didn't get something essentially exactly like Oasis uh, in, in the next 20, 30, 40 years. I, I'm not sure exactly. There's some probably some really substantial technological hurdles still, but like I, I just you know with the direction that that stuff is going. I just don't see how we don't get there. 
Yeah, I mean, it, it, it's so funny because it's like it's what everyone wants, really. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> it's what I want. Yeah, I mean, I would I would spend all my time in Oasis. Yeah, and it's so fun. It, it's like there's so many other ideologies of the internet that are just presented in there. Just as they present you know, the work world as being this slavish, gross, dirty environment. Well, in there, it's, you know, every famous classic book, movie, television show is all available for free for anyone at any time. Mm-hmm. That whole idea of freedom of knowledge um, really, really cleverly implemented and compellingly implemented. Yeah. And the, just... and the school system, like the idea of a school planet, <laughs> I was like, oh, yeah. Oh, I know. It's just like, I didn't go to a school planet. I just went to like this, you know, school hovel thing. It's like with a dingy building and all sorts of reality around it. I mean, <laughs> who needs that, Sean? And, uh, you know, I also think that the book did a really good job of exploring the notion of identity in virtual space. That it's this odd mix of extreme personalization and vanity and self-obsession with complete and total utter anonymity and uninterestingness Mm -hmm. that you know um your your school is labeled with a number people all look good but they all buy the same inexpensive model because they don't have enough credits um like like all that sort of stuff really rings true because you know i the the notion of anonymity is obviously like sort of a hot topic in in today's internet space where people like Mm -hmm. no i really want to make sure i keep my anonymity and part of me is like you're always going to have your anonymity. No one, give, no one cares about you. <laughs> anonymity through mediocrity. <laughs> yeah, well, <laughs> right? You know, like, like. I mean, I, I suppose this is like, like a poor timing statement on my part because of the recent, you know, NSA surveillance <laughs> stuff going down. But, but I mean, there's, you know, there's some guy who like comes home and plays his free to play games and gets on Reddit and looks at cat photos and is like, not another cat, and downvotes it, and that's the entire influence he has on the world. It's like, uh, what, do you, what do you mean you care? Like, I don't want my real name out there. Like, and you know what? people are going to forget your real name immediately. <laughs> like, and, and that's like a really interesting dichotomy because, like, in, in real life, there are people I don't know who really still resonate with me like on my walk to um when i used to go to usc used to walk to school and there was like a bike shop that would walk by every day and i just to see the owner i've never said hi to him but like totally know what he looks like but it's a lot harder to be anonymous because you get that like visual tie but i don't know i thought that was like really a sort of cool juggle you know Mm -hmm. you get that extreme anonymity and then you get the guys who like carries a ninja sword everywhere that's awesome yeah yep I found another thing that was cool, which is a point you made when we were, you know, pre-discussing this, is the the, the way that the um, treasure hunt was sort of solved was through this really, really deep, obscure puzzle solving that was actually also very indicative of 80s adventure games. Yeah. Um, you know, it's not like modern games where it's like, well, look for the where the golden sparkle or, you know, where the lights you know, cross or where the big humongous blue arrow that says, yeah, it's, it's just, it's the just, puzzle solution is here. here. Yeah, yeah, it's like, is it here? Okay, I, no, we have to go this way. The arrow protruding from my forehead needs us to go north. Like, mm-hmm. like, like the, in, in modern games, they expect you to, to, okay, look. There's this thing in game design called flow, which is the idea that you never want a, your game to be so boring that people just give up on it. Um, because it's it, it, you don't want it so easy that it's boring and people give up on it. But you don't want it so hard that it's frustrating and people get pissed off and quit. You want it to be right in the middle where people feel a challenge, but they feel like they're making progress. So you get modern games like Super Meat Boy or Dark Souls. Brilliantly designed games, but you have all the information there, but it's just hard to pull off. But the old school games, you know, like you were just saying... They were hard because you just didn't know what you had to do, and it was completely yep. unclear. Remember, you were talking about of... you were talking about Simon's Quest. Yeah, just like, well, you take the blue orb and you just obviously kneel at the spot, and thirty seconds later, this world one takes you to the next area. I just, you know, come and that, on. That's not an exaggeration. You've never heard of Simon's Quest as a Castlevania game where you actually had to hold the blue orb, go to an uninteresting dead end, sit there. You couldn't stand there. You had to kneel and for 30 seconds, and then a world would pick you up. You just had to know. I think there was some clues in the game, but they were really obscure. Um, 
A, mo a modern example of a game that has some really obscure puzzles is uh, Fez. If you haven't played Fez, you really should. Uh, yeah. it's, it, you don't have to do any of the obscure, obscure puzzles to beat the game, but there's like a bunch of optional things you can do, and a lot of them are of, of that level where it's just like it takes... It's not quite guesswork, but it just it takes almost like an obsessive level of like digging into information, trial and error, and everything else to figure out what you actually need to do. Um, yeah, I mean, there were some puzzles that like communities were working on for months after that game came out, and they like hadn't solved it, right? Yep. Uh, it's also worth noting there was a puzzle inside um, the book Ready Player One um, that no one solved until the author announced that it existed and gave sort of a hint. To, to its existence, uh, I believe it was nine months after publication. Uh, once the hint was there, people solved it relatively quickly, but I thought that was kind of cool. Wait, wait, w w what is this referencing? No, in, in the book Ready Player One, there are, there, like, the, the author created, like, his own treasure hunt. Go on. And I don't know this. Tell me about I, this. I don't actually know super, I don't know a ton of details about that. I just remember reading a little bit about it. Uh, and uh oh that's that's cool yeah. god that's <laughs> it's pretty sweet but you know it, like because uh, i remember when i was very young i mean like the i i had zork zork 2 zork 3 zork 0 zork nemesis um, <laughs> nice i had a lot of zork games like zork nemesis was cool it had like a little window of ascii it kind of shows you it was a castle i played a lot of um and it, it was this weird feeling because, you know, when you're a kid, you just don't know that things suck, right? You know, like like the movie about gerbils that are spies that, like, have to defend the world. That movie was horrible. But if you're six, there's gerbils. So it's the best thing ever. And that's how I viewed these Zord games. And I remember, you know, just, like, wandering around, um, dying constantly to Gru's. And it, it was this weird feeling when, you know, you'd be exploring the house in the woods nearby and you'd find this cave and you, you had gone everywhere, but the game wasn't done. And you had these items and you just start trying things. And what was amazing is it wasn't just locations in those games. You actually had to type in the command. So you'd be like, go east and be like, you're standing in front of a tree. Um, there's a path to the left and to the right. And then you can type climb tree and it'll be like you climb up the tree. And there were these keywords like climb or dig that in some places be like, I don't know what you mean by verb, whatever verb you typed in. So you climb the tree and there's like an egg that's with gold jewels in it. And you're just like, take the egg. And also you're wandering around, you have this like jeweled egg and you don't know what to do with it. And I still remember these feelings of you know working around and suddenly you type in something and the game reacts in a way that you would have never expected and all of a sudden you're in a new area and it was just this overwhelming thrill this rush like what is this place this is so crazy mm -hmm. mist also i think was the probably the last notable game that that kind of behaved like this in some ways where you just be like you have to do what mm -hmm. to solve that puzzle and most people just quit those games because you couldn't do anything. Mm -hmm. It was just impossible to get anywhere. And what I think is so cool about Ready Player One is it sets up one of those impossible problems. How do you find three keys and three gates in Oasis, which is bigger than the imaginable universe in scope and size? There are whole planets that are shopping malls. How do you find six things in this infinite space that's the goal i just wouldn't even care i wouldn't i wouldn't do it but i just get to see someone solve it so i get the same thrill of discovery as as you would in one of those old school games with all the interesting layers like you know people talking about uh gunters the dumb kids who are obsessed with it and like no one cares about it anymore mm -hmm. like that's that's how a lot of the old adventure games were people like Dude, if you beat Zork, it's like no, because I'm an adult and I have things to do. We're like, <laughs> mm -hmm. stuff. I just thought it was like a cool parallel in terms of that yeah. structure, because I still don't know how to beat any of those Zork games. Yep, I think it's a, I think it's 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 really cool how that sort of like, um, the just this, it's almost like a game within a game structure. Um, it's yeah. like Inception before Inception. Was it before Inception? I don't know. 
I can't back the statement up. Hold on, let me... Don't skewer me! <laughs> Hold on. Let me... uh -oh. I don't know why I got the book. I can just look up both online. <laughs> Everything's there. Okay, ready player one. I'm going to find this out. 2011 is when it was released. As was Inception, wasn't it? Wikipedia.org Inception. Inception. A 2010 science fiction. Oh. Uh. Well, I, it's a good thing I didn't make that comparison in the first place, Sean. Why, why were you looking that up again? <laughs> I'm confused. Wow. And this is this is the weird thing about the internet is now I just want to read about Inception. I'm like, really? It was nominated for that many awards and it won Best Sound Editor. It's amazing. It yeah. did have good sound. Yeah. Uh, I don't. I think we are, you know, in the in the in earnest attempt to keep our episodes shorter. Do you want to have any last words? Yeah. Well, I mean, I honestly think that this is like, I think that this book is a great example of what you were talking about uh, about how there's actually I my last words are I want you to conclude. But the thing you were talking about, that there's like 60 things that can make a book good. Mm -hmm. um, sure. Because you're using this argument with, with, with Twilight before. Sure. Um, so basically, you know, we, it's easy to look at a book and basically say, I love this book because of X, or this book is bad because of Y. Uh, and the reason I bring Twilight in is because Twilight's an example of a book where a lot of people look at it and they say, it is bad because of X, Y, or Z. Uh, whether, the X, whether that's prose, uh, whether that's the way that um, she portrays the main character, whether that's the way she portrays the relationship. Um, and I think that's just, that, that's a, um, sort of an unfair way to look at a book because a book is a collection, is a collection of like a hundred different layers. Uh, mm. The prose is basically one of those layers. Um, the way each relationship is handled is one of those layers. The way each character is handled is one of those layers. The setting is a layer. Uh, the way the setting interacts with the story is a layer. The dialogue's a layer. The, if the book's high concept, that's a layer. Um, and a book really only needs to hit home runs on a few layers, if the if if those are real home runs, for it to be mega popular. Twilight hits home runs on a few layers for certain key demographics, namely generally teenage woman. Um, and that's to be clear, that's not the only group of people that like Twilight, but like that's it's that's where it hits all most of its home runs. Um, and once someone's responded to some part of the book, then it doesn't matter if the prose isn't that great or if this one character is flat or if the chapter transitions are handled poorly. They just don't care. And why should they? They have something they love about this book um, and they're going to enjoy it. Uh, I have plenty of books that I absolutely adore that you know fail at a number of levels if you want to get nitpicky, but who cares? No book succeeds at every level. Uh, let, uh, every level, um, it, all that matters is that it succeeds at the levels for you. Ready Player One. I think if you want to nitpick certain things, um, it has a ton of exposition. It's full of info dumps where it's not even like a disguised info dump. It's just <laughs> like, let me tell you about this, and it just like saw, very plainly says, and this was done this, and this is the history, and this was the year it was done, and there's some facts about this. Uh, or it's like, and he played this video game, and this video game's called Blah, and it was done in this. And it's just like, it's it's very static. And it's so easy for someone who doesn't, isn't, isn't already enjoying the book to look at it and say, well, this book sucks. Look at all this exposition and look at all these info dumps. I don't, yeah. like, those are bad things to do. And then they totally ignore the fact that, no, the reason this book is succeeding um, is because of everything we just talked about. Because it's resonating so hard with such a, with a huge audience. Um, and it, it, it nails that and once it's nailed that you're not sitting there going well this book is everything I've always dreamed about but man he's using some info dumps I don't know <laughs> Mr. Klein I really wonder about you you're just like no fucking awesome Actually, and then someone else says info dump and you're like who gives a shit <laughs> okay so I have a question for you sure what's the main character's name Wade I think it's Wade Watts I, I don't even I don't even remember like, like, I don't remember except I read it just before we did this. So. Yeah, you know, I I don't know what his lady friend's name is. Artemis. Ah, oh, that's right. With a three. Yep. I mean, like, rings a bell, but it's not things that, like stuck with me. Yeah, you yeah. Know? No, I totally agree. Like, if if before I looked at it again, if you had asked me, I would have had a hard time naming any yeah. of the characters. Or, or in the Matrix, you know, it's Neo and Morpheus. You yep. know that, but you know, I I'd, I'd say that that you know, I feel like it's. It's just a stunning example of how you can succeed so well in ways that are sort of atypical 
but yep. there's clearly a hunger and a thirst for it. And I think a couple modern games really show that, like Mass Effect and um, Skyrim, actually most of the Elder Scrolls game, where there's just straight info dump resources. Like in uh, Mass Effect, you have a codex where every time you find an object, you can hit, you can pause it, go to the codex section, and there's just a guy who's like. The Rachni were extinct in the, after the Rachni War, where humanity blah, 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 blah. Or, you know, in Skyrim, you just find a book and you open it up and it's just like a story. And you just mm-hmm. sit there and you page this book. You don't have to do it, but people love that sort of thing. So I just, I think it's really cool to see, like, a, a non-interactive uh, uh, media that, like, uses that sort of yep. intense resonance. So, with that said, my name is Sean Plutt. And I'm Tristan Brandt. And thank you for watching episode 5 of Why We Like It. I guarantee we're going to make this better than, like, monthly. Mm. Either way, thanks for watching. Bi-monthly, too. Yeah, right on. Thanks for watching, everyone. Bye! See ya.